Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm R.K. Brown. That's I'm Kevin, Kevin Ray. Ray. <laughs> Sorry about that, man. Sorry to step all over you. Uh, we're, we're kind of trying to figure out how we're going to do this thing. It's all new to us. But uh, today, Kevin has a story for y'all, and uh, it's a pretty elaborate story. We call it the timeline, the Great Tribulation timeline. And uh, it's a lot of scripture, so we're just going to get right down into it. We're going to say a prayer because we want the Lord to bless this thing. We want to help people Amen. understand. Um, Kevin and I really haven't talked about this, so as we go along, I may have commentary on it. You know, we may not be exactly on the same page on this thing, which is why we call our show Iron Sharpens Iron. Amen. And uh, because that's what the Bible says, that iron sharpens iron, and uh, it sharpens everybody's blade, you know. So uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to pray to the Lord and ask him to give us help, and we're going to get down into some Bible reading. I'm going to turn my microphone up here. There we go. And um, it wasn't over line. It was just in my ears. And uh, anyway, um, I'm going to pray. So here we go. Father God, thank you for making us able to do this, Lord. This is amazing to me. I, I, I sit here at my computer, and I'm blown away about the things that regular guys like us are able to do because technology has leveled the playing field. Amen. I, I do believe that technology is going to bring us trouble because of the image of the beast, and I may have commentary to say about that if it shows up in the body of text that we're going to read today. But right now, Lord, technology is blessing us, and it's helping your kingdom, I know, because I've gotten a lot of blessing Amen. from other people using technology. So, Father, I pray that you um, just bless this thing today. Cause a lot of people to tune in, Lord, and let us help them. And, Lord, you help all of us, us and them. I don't want to be redundant, so I'll just move on and say, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tell us the story, Kevin. All right, well, first let's, let's, uh, let's start off with the premise of the story. We're actually coming in the middle of the story. The story actually starts with, uh, if you were in Revelation 6, in the very beginning of it, it's uh, when, the, when the first seal is open, bam, you're in. You're, I look at it as like a play, okay? Like, the, like when Jesus opens the first seal, we're in the seven-year tribulation period. The first seal, the second seal, the third seal, and the fourth seal. Follow along with what Daniel saw in Daniel 7. So if you're trying to figure out the Revelation timeline, instead of trying to go through all through Revelation, trying to put this chapter with this chapter and all that, um, it does fit together like a puzzle piece. But a great place to start is paralleling Revelation 6, the first seal, with what Daniel saw with his beasts in Daniel 7. And you'll see that they follow right along with one another. Um, the four beasts that Daniel sees and the four beasts that John sees, they see the same exact thing, but they describe it a little differently, just like you see um, in the Olivet Discourse whenever Matthew, Mark, and Luke have just a little bit different commentary about what Jesus was saying. But it essentially says the same things, and we get a little bit more information from each individual account of the testimony. Do you agree with that, R.K., pretty much? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And let every matter be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? That's exactly, exactly. And um, and I'm glad that Jesus did it that way in the Bible because in court, that's the same way. That if you go to, into a courtroom and you have more than one witness as the testimony, you don't want the testimony to be identical because then it sounds rehearsed. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not rehearsed. They're telling, they're, they're giving their accounts of what Jesus said and, and to what the Holy Spirit inspired them to, to put down on the paper. And um, and and their their accounts are different, but yet they tell the same exact story. Okay, and um, also it's interesting and it, it's something important to note that Matthew twenty four, uh, Luke uh, twenty one, and Mark thirteen all tell the same story. Uh, about the first half of tribulation, um, and as it parallels, because they they asked, and, and we might differ a little bit here, RK, on this. But, um, they did ask um, it uh, about what was the, these things to come, and Jesus was talking about what was going to happen in seventy A.D. In your view, yes, and, and I agree with that. I do agree with that. But I also think that he paralleled that with what was going to happen in the end times, because they're strikingly similar to what's happened, what what we see happening. Um, uh, today as well. It is true. There's no, there's no denying that. Uh, you're, what you're saying is basically a double fulfillment. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And there, 
and there is a there is a uh, a Bible uh, defense for the idea of a double fulfillment. Like for instance, when Isaiah, I believe he was talking to King Hezekiah, if I if I remember correctly, in mm-hmm. Isaiah chapter seven, and he said, uh, "And the virgin and the virgin shall be with child," and he was actually talking about his own wife, but. We know for sure, or he was actually talking about the woman, I guess, that became his wife, you know, that Isaiah was. But we know for sure because Matthew clearly tells us that that scripture was fulfilled that said, and the virgin shall be with child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. That was in Isaiah 14. It was fulfilled then, and it was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. So there is a doctrine for double fulfillment. Amen. Thank you for that, R.K. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, so basically what's happening is if we look at those first um, four seals, and we're going to get a little bit into the four seal too with this, because that's kind of where it starts off. Where I want to start off the story is right before the Antichrist shows up, what exactly happens that we're going to see? Now, in, in the Olivet Discourse, whenever you, in Mark, Ma, uh, Matthew, and Luke, there's a lot of very ambiguous signs, such as like... Um, uh, the love of many will wax cold. We could go on for hours about that, right? Oh, yeah. But there could be an argument made that that has been going on for years and years and years, that, you know, that the love of many has waxed, uh, has waxed cold, and people will argue that. I would say that it's getting progressively worse in these days that, that, that we see now. But, again, that is a bit ambiguous to use that as a hard sign that, hey, Jesus is about to come back because this is happening. Look at how mean everybody is. You know what I mean? It seems a little ambiguous to me. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, I, I dig what you're saying, and I and I, want, I, I might argue that, maybe. But I might also say that the European countries and the United States were Christian countries. You know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. I mean, I'm talking about some strong Christianity. The Europeans mm-hmm. oh, yeah. um, evangelized the Americas, you know, the colonies, and then the colonies evangelized the world. The, you know, the colonies became the United States of America and evangelized the world. Then, of course, the Europeans, the British especially, evangelized the world too. There's a lot of wrong that has gone on in ages past, for sure. But, man, the whole world is now turning away from Jesus Christ, even Falling the Christian away. world. Amen. Even the, yes, yeah, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Absolutely. Because I know that scripture is there, so. Yeah, I mean, but like the love of many wax cold, um, the gospel should be published or preached into all nations. I mean, yeah. we have the Internet now. Um, I've heard people um, argue on the Internet. Uh, um, I've, I've watched this argument go on about, you know, that it hasn't been preached in all nations. And, you know, there might be a point to that, but um, we do have the Internet now, and I'm not sure exactly what God means by that to be honest with you. I don't know how, how deeply it goes. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts on that are that in uh, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Bible gave this list of you know people. I think it gave a list of like 17 different languages. you know, And it said men from every nation under heaven were there to hear the gospel. And so essentially there is a sense that those men were represent, representatives of their country. So if they had the gospel, then surely, they if they made it back to their country alive, then surely they preached the gospel in their country. So in that sense, it, the gospel was preached to every nation under heaven at the day of Pentecost. The day and of then Pentecost. the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul even talks about that the gospel was preached in every nation. Mm-hmm. So that's another one of those kind of double fulfillment things exactly. because the world exactly. the world spread out you exactly. know what i'm saying and it's and now, it does say that it, and the gospel shall be preached and, and published in all nations and then the end shall come that's right you know and, and so it, yeah so it kind of has to be now doesn't it yes. because uh, yeah. the fact that we're sitting here you know we're not going to be like philosophers and say well are we really sitting here no we're we're yeah. sitting here and uh <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah we're we're sitting here and uh so, therefore, that must have a fulfillment that is yet to happen. But I'll tell you what, man, the gospel has been preached. I mean, it's been preached everywhere. It has. It's been preached in every nation under heaven. It may not be preached to everybody in every nation under heaven, but it has been preached in every nation Amen. under heaven. Ain't no doubt about it. Amen. Okay. So and, if that's, and if that's the standard, 
if that's the uh, if that's the goal that's set right before the end times, is, ladies and gentlemen, we are there. I think so too, buddy. I do. I do. Uh, um, and you know, here's one thing I want to interject right now for those people that are listening or watching or whatever. Um, we don't, the, the, the objective here that we're trying to do is to try to educate people on what the gospel is saying. We're, we're two men trying to decipher what the gospel is saying, trying to figure out exactly what it is that God is saying is happening at the end. Are we in the end times? Not to scare anybody, but for those people who are in Christ, to be patient and wait and love on the love on the Lord, be yearning for his return, be getting rid of your worldly you know, your worldly desires and things like that, and be looking towards him and the return of him. You know, to be yeah, watching amen. For him and, be, and be yearning for him, be yearning for him to return. Well, I could give you a whole, we could sit here for hours and I could tell you about all kinds of reasons why, um, uh, that I want him to, to come back. One is that I have an eight year old boy that I am raising. And now because the gospel and listen, I have, you know, against the homosexual themselves and bring in the Christ, I want to, I yearn for everybody to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I yearn for everybody to come to the truth and belief and lead them into repentance of their sins. Amen. You're going to struggle with stuff. We all have thorns. Paul had thorns. We have thorns. There's going to be, but boy, to have a repentant heart and say, I know this is wrong. Instead of having, as, as the gospel says in second Thessalonians two, have pleasure in unrighteousness. Don't have pleasure in it. Struggle with it. Right. You know, I, I want people to struggle with it. I want them to know that it's a sin. But look, it's you know it, those sins are going to be there. We're in the flesh. But to know that to yearn for Jesus Christ, to yearn for the truth, you know. So, but in in this day and age now, it's it's legal for for homosexuals to marry and things like that. And and now, if I speak against it or I say that's not what the Bible says to my eight year old son, well, now I'm a bigot. You know, right. I'm a bigot. And how long is it going to be before they make the law to where not only is a, is am I a bigot, but I also can't, uh, I also, you know, can't speak out against it anymore. How long is it going to be before it's hate speech to even say what I believe? Right. You know, so I see the end coming, even in little things like that as well. So, yeah. but moving on from there, th there's a few other signs, you know, there's earthquakes in diverse places, which we've seen some of that going on. You know, there's pestilences um, and, but the, but, there's some biggies that happen too. Also, we need to see Christians being killed and being martyred because that yeah. happens in the first half of tribulation because that's what Jesus Christ said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They recounted Jesus Christ saying they will deliver you up to be afflicted. This is before the abomination of desolation. It's important to note that the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist is revealed. So at that point in time, whenever that leads up to that, that's where I'm headed right now, okay? And we'll get into Scripture right now, and we'll jump right into it. Right now, where we're going is we're going right where, right before the Antichrist is revealed. What's happening right then? When the four seals open, what are those kind of things that we need to be looking for? What are some hard signs that we need to see before we know, uh-oh, he's coming, and he's coming quickly? Also, another thing to note, R.K. and I differ on our belief of when the rapture or the translation happens. R.K. believes right. it happens at the very end of the, of the seven years. Um, yep. The mystery shall be fulfilled. He's got a very strong argument for that. I have a very strong argument for the sixth seal. We're not going to get into that today, I don't think. But, no, I don't think so either. But, but what, we, what we can agree on is that there's no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. We both we, are in concordance of that. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been studying hard the Bible for about twenty one years, <laughs> and in that twenty one years, I ain't seen it yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm telling you, people, I, I know the Bible pretty well. I've he read does. it through a bunch of times. I know I'm a blind guy, but I've read the Bible, and it ain't there. And the scripture that a lot of people use, including my beloved pastor, who I love very much will tell you that John chapter 4, where Jesus, John chapter 4, verse 1, where uh, Jesus hears a vo or John hears a voice that says, come up hither, and then immediately I was in the Spirit, they call that the rapture of the church. And, yeah. the, argument, and the argument they use for that, and, and even Jack Van Impey does that. That's a guy who has the Bible memorized, basically. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's one thing to memorize, it's another thing to know it, to understand if you know what it. I mean. Yeah. And uh, he... Well, that's John I've, being taken in the spirit up to see these things that he has to account for in Revelation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, but the argument that they use is is that the word church appears nowhere in the book yeah. of Revelation after that. Actually, up until they don't say this, but actually it does appear again in, in uh, chapter 22, 
when Jesus says again, this was, you know, the message that the Lord was delivering to the churches, you know, mm -hmm. I paraphrase. Yeah. But um, um, that's an argument that they use. And my, my counter argument to that is you may not see the word church used, but you see the word elected, saints. They elect saints. I mean, yeah, all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, my, my argument to that might be that it might be that the churches are dissolved. If you want to use that for an argument, I don't even think that's a strong argument at all. No, but if you I want to know. use that for an argument, then I would argue that it might be that the churches have just been dissolved. Yeah. And we're all just maybe, maybe we're it's, all doing whatever we can. It, well, I'm not it saying, could be. It, you know. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm married to that idea or anything like that. I'm just saying if if I were going to argue with them about that, I would say, well, it might be. Mm -hmm. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and it might just be the, the elect and the saints are out just, just on their own. That, 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 yeah. That's plausible, man. That's actually a, a, a pretty decent argument, actually. Uh, that's plausible. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I mean, when it says the elect and the saints, man, I, I look, look, here's another thing. I believe that the elect and the saints come from everywhere. I believe that I don't believe that it's from one church, like one denomination has it all right. I don't believe that. Right. I believe That's me too. You know, I believe that there might there's Catholic people that'll be, you know, like this isn't right and they'll move away from it and they'll move because it says come out of my people. I believe that there's people that are with Christ that are all over the place that'll see it and will know and they'll be aware. Okay. I don't care if you believe in pre tribulation rapture or not, whenever the Antichrist is revealed, if you're truly elect, you'll drop that doctrine real quick like a hot potato. You'll say, I was wrong on that. This can't be right because yeah, and and those with uh, with a pre-tribulation view, I just encourage you to be very open-minded here with what we're ready, about ready to discuss here, because we're going to give you a lot of scripture, which we need to get a into. Lot. And um and and uh, you you'll you'll start seeing some things unfold maybe you haven't seen, and 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 if nothing else, let your heart put in the back of your mind and put in the back of your heart that maybe there is some truth to this, and if it comes down the pike, um, let this kind of sink in, and and you might have to go and maybe examine your pre-tribulation beliefs that and and let them go at that point. You know. Yeah, and you know what else? Uh, and we've talked about this a pretty good bit. That uh, it that pr that whole pre-tribulation rapture idea. Of course, it didn't. Nobody even thought about that idea until a guy named John Darby came along in the 1830s. Yeah, and he taught a disciple, a man named Cyrus Schofield, and Schofield created the Schofield Bible, which he had his Bible notes right in the middle of the text, which talked about the rapture, pre-trib rapture, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, it may be the devil's device to cause a great falling away. It may because, be. Because when tribulation starts getting poured on real heavy, people are going to fall away. They're going to be offended, and when they're offended, as the Bible says, when you know they'll endure for a while and for a time, but when they're offended for the word's sake, you know they're going to fall. And yep. I think that's what's going to happen. They're going to come up to, and it, it may be even a thing to where they think this thing in the middle is is really good, and we'll talk about that too. You know, okay, how it's really good. So let's jump into that. Okay, so basically we're saying that um, if you believe in pre-trib rapture, just hang in with us. We're not we're not casting you out because you may still be our brothers in Christ here. We're not saying that you're you're in, in just dire straits here. Um, but we're, yeah, and you might be right, but I don't think so. Really? You know what I'm saying? You, you, you pre-tribbers, you might be right, but no. no. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I mean, I mean, we can we can have a show on just for the rapture if you want, and I'll, I'll, I would love to go through that. I got all, You and I will disagree, but we'll be completely on board with the pre-trib. We both can take that apart pretty easily. No question about that. Yeah. Um, well, you want to get into some scripture? Let's get into some scripture. Let's start with Revelation 6, 7, 8. Let's start right there on that scripture there. Go ahead and read it, R.K. All right. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Okay. Um, now, mind you that there's a big argument that's out there that there's going to be peace on earth for the first three and a half years, that the Antichrist is going to be on the scene and he's going to bring peace on earth. Does that sound like peace on earth to you? Uh, no. See what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't sound like <laughs> peace on earth to me. It sounds to me, if you look at the first three seals that are coming out, it doesn't seem to me like there's any peace. It seems like there's a lot of turmoil here at this point. 
Okay, if you now, if you don't mind, would you go to Daniel seven uh, seven right now? If you if you people are reading along here, um, Daniel seven seven. Daniel seven seven. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Okay. Now, this is very interesting here, because this is Daniel's account of the same thing that John's saying, and John calls it, instead of hell, death and hell, which are capitalized, by the way, in the King James Bible, right. this calls it dreadful and terrible. Okay, so we are talking about something very bad on earth. But the, the key thing I wanted to, sh just to focus in on here is it says it had ten horns. Yes. Okay? Now, this is a, a very interesting piece of Scripture because if you look right now and you go to Revelation 12, uh, th I'm, 12, 3. I'm there. Okay? And there, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, this language of the ten horns, if you do a, if you do a, a scripture search of the ten horns throughout scripture, the only time that it ever refers to the devil having ten horns is in the seven-year tribulation period. Okay? There's no other place to where the devil is described as, as being a red dragon or having ten horns, seven heads, and ten horns. That is a strict re reference to the uh, um, to the devil in this period of time, a description of the devil in this time. Do you agree? Concur with that? Yes. Okay. That, that makes sense. Okay. So, if, if what is the seven heads and ten horns? Well, we have to read on a little further, and we need to get a little bit more understanding. So, let's go to Revelation thirteen one through two. Thirteen. Okay. Let's see. I don't think I have it in that order here. I've got Revelation twelve now. Let me. See. Okay. okay. Here we go. Here we go. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority." Okay, so we see right here is that is that the this the devil now is rising up. But it's, what's funny is is in the in the in the Bible heads denotes like leaders, okay, like lead like like people that lead, and horns denote like kingdoms, okay. Um, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here on this, okay, but I believe that horns denote kind of like in the in back in the day. Um, that that a lot of the kingdoms that were fairly close together, and they would use horn blasts across great distances to signal one another of things. So they, they, each kingdom had a horn, a pretty good sizable horn. If, am I correct on this? Is that a, is well, that a I mean, yeah, it's a common, it's a common, uh, yeah, it's a, it was a common use of a war cry and, you know, you know, yeah. getting people ready for war. And even the Apostle Paul talks about that in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It says, if the horn doesn't make a distinctive sound, then who, who knows to be ready for the battle? That's right. And so it, and he has ten crowns, and, and the heads of his name is blasphemy. So this is not the devil. This is what's really interesting here, is this is not one man here. This is an entire system that's rising up. And, and, and R.K., you said something interesting today about the sand of the sea. Would you elaborate on that, what, you, what your findings are on that? Well, I hadn't really developed any real hard doctrine on it, but... You know, I saw the beast. Was that the scripture that we were just at there? Yeah, uh, sand of the sea, rise up. Out and of I the stood up. Yeah, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Um, the Bible, and I wish I had scripture pulled up. Um, I wish I had scripture ready to to pull up, but I don't. But if you do a study on the sand of the sea, the main thing it makes me think about is God telling Abraham that That's I will right. multiply thy seed. Yes. As the, as the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea. And thou saidest, I will surely, this is Genesis 32, 12. Uh, and thou saidest, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed this, as the sand of the sea, which cannot, which, uh, cannot be numbered for mul uh, multitude. That's, that's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because, yeah. I, I, I mean, could this indicate maybe a little bit that whatever the system is rising up, it's a, it appears to be a good thing. 
You know, awesome. Well, it appears to be a good thing. Uh, it appears to me that it is real similar to Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, where the man of sin is standing in the temple of God. Well, the temple of God is not in any way the temple standing over there on Mount Moriah or whatever mountain it is over there, the Temple Mount. Uh, that's not the temple of God because, uh, you know, God dwelt in that temple in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was gone out of there. God doesn't dwell there. God dwells in the hearts of no. men. Ye are that the we temple are, of God. We are the temple of God made up of lively stones. So God dwells in us. We are the temple. Mm -hmm. And that's verified in Acts chapter 15 when James talked about that, uh, that he quotes David as saying that God will uh, rebuild the temple and blah, blah, blah. But he's talking about the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the Jew and the Gentiles sharing together the gospel. And that is the temple that he's talking about. Okay. All right. Clearly in the context. Okay. Sorry, I'm confusing. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Okay, so as we're seeing here, this is the fourth seal. We're seeing what's rising up here is we're seeing a lot of war, just to put it in, in perspective of what we're seeing in an earthly way. You're, there's, we're talking a lot of uh, symbology here. Let's talk earthly here. We're seeing a, a system rise up that is taking over from the UN, that's taking over from the new world order, that's going to be, uh, or taking over from the UN and bringing about a new world order, which um, is going to have like some kind of a 10 zone system or 10 heads, kind of, seven head kind of deal with 10, 10 zone system. Um, I, there's a uh, thing called the Club of Rome, which I have done some uh, studying on. And um, the Club of Rome has 10 zones in it in which, uh, uh, ironically, there's only three countries that are not on board with it right now, and they are North Korea, Syria, and Iran. And um, China... Isn't that remarkable? Yes, it's remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we're trying, to, we're trying to clue you in on what's going on in the world here. Um, and these are... And, and what is needing to be established in these last three countries is a bank is a bank. They do not have central banks in them. All other countries have a central bank. It is a prerequisite that nobody can run to a country for refuge. They need to have control over the entire world. The devil needs to have control over the entire world to bring about the mark of the beast, to bring about to where no man could buy or sell, save he the mark of the beast. Hey, Which Kevin, uh, before you go any further, define what you mean by bank, because right now people who are, are, are you know, maybe not learned in okay. the ways of the right. Council on Foreign Relations and all that stuff, the builder, right. you know, the, the Rothschilds right. and all, yeah, kind of hip them a little bit. Okay, if this is the first time you've ever heard of this, there is a, um, there is a banking conglomerate. You've got to go way back, and without going into the history of it, I'm just going to do a really brief under, uh, uh, history lesson on this. Basically, there was a series of bankers that got together and started a cabal underneath the Rothschild banking dynasty into where they were taking control of the monetary systems of every country to where, like, the countries couldn't have their independent currencies to where if, if, if they could, but they would control the currencies themselves. So, the, and uh, I think it was Amschel Rothschild that said, give me control over a nation's monetary system, and I care not who makes their laws. It really doesn't matter whether they're communist or or uh, capitalist, it doesn't matter. As long as they control the monetary system, they control the people. You control somebody's livelihood with money, doesn't matter what the money looks like, you control them. Well, there's three countries they don't control, which is Iran, Syria, and North Korea. Now think about the three countries that we're seeing us go to war with right now, okay? All right, now this is the Rothschilds, this is the, the Zionists, this is, this is where they're coming from. They, they are controlling the money. OK, so this 10 B system cannot rise up until these three countries fall. You're going to need to see Syria fall. You're going to need to see North Korea fall. And you're going to need to see um, also as well as uh, Iran, which is, I believe is the last one. Now, go ahead. You got to. Can I, can I interrupt? Yeah. Absolutely. Go yeah. Ahead. Maybe not fall totally because America didn't fall and America got a central bank in, in uh, 1913. Well, I call so that they may a not, fall. <laughs> like for me, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, certainly an economic fall, but it yes. may not be a uh, national, for like, lack of a better word, sovereign fall. Yeah, or though, destroying you know, our uh, 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 foreign occupation coming in. Because, right, I mean, actually, right now, North Korea, which is communist Asian, 
is now in negotiations with China, ironically enough. Commun- you know, they're communist state. You would think that China would be supporting North Korea against the United States. That would make the most sense. They're both Asian. They're both communist. That would make the most sense. But it's not that way. China is already in- has control of that region of the world, of that tin horn. And North Korea belongs to them. It belongs in that tenth horn. And they, they told uh, uh, Trump to back off, that would let us handle this diplomatically. I mean, it only makes sense if they're going to be swallowed into the tenth horn. They certainly don't want to have a ravaged, worn, torn country. To come, yeah, right. You know what I mean? And it makes yeah. no sense if they can get, you know, Kim Jong Un or whatever his name is to just simply say, OK, hand, hand him the ball of the monetary system and play ball with the rest of the world, which they've been isolated from then no harm, no foul. That's all they really need. And there will be no need for bombs to be dropped. They'll have a diplomatic solution. Right. And so that only makes sense to me. So, but I mean, you would think that China would be on their side and we would have a war with China, but that's not exactly what's going on. Well, you would think, but then when you look in history, it is clear. I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of research on this. And it is very clear that that guy Warburg, I can't think of his first name, but that guy that came over from Germany that was representative of the Rothschilds, that helped start our central bank, also funded Vladimir Lenin to yes, start yes, the Bolshevik right. Revolution. Which was, yeah, they, so through the Jews. They put him, they put him on a train car, or yeah. they put him, put him on a ship, him and a bunch of his thugs from New York City, put him on a ship and sent him over to Europe, and the English government actually detained them for a while. And, and our president, uh, Woodrow Wilson, actually told the British to let them go. So they let them go. They put them on a train car in Europe and took them into Russia where they financed a revolution yeah. called the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm-hmm. That is the truth. If you don't believe it, do the research. It's very well documented. And this is what they've been doing for a long, long time. And they have just about got it done. They've just about just accomplished. About. Yeah. So and, and that leads me to another thing. And I want to get into the scriptures because right now we're seeing an awful lot of problems with Syria. OK. And if you look at Isaiah 17, 1. Well, we've got here. Oh, look, Isaiah 17, 1. <laughs> it says the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus, which has stood since the days that Christ walked there. Remember, uh, uh, Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. What's going on right now in Syria, okay? Well, <laughs> I think everybody knows what's going on in Syria. <laughs> that, you know, uh, Aleppo has already basically been a ru- is a ruinous it heap. It is a ruinous heap. <laughs> and Damascus is well on the way to being a ruinous heap. That's right. And and the uh, you've got Israel and the Saudi, Saudi Arabia and the United States all coming against Syria. So, I mean, it's just a matter of time, I believe, until you see yeah. that fall. Yeah. Okay. And, then, yeah, and that actually will be a fall. Yes, that will be. It'll have to be a ruinous heap, so it'll, it'll be destroyed. There's no doubt about yeah. it. So when you see that happening, you better start looking up because your redemption draweth nigh. We're, 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 real, we're real close at that point. Yeah, for real. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just want to say something that I'm going to just float a little conspiracy out there just because that's how I roll. It's all right, brother. That's how I roll. Um, I do not believe that. Well, what's that guy that runs Syria, the, the president of Saad. Syria? Assad. Assad, yeah. I do not believe that he gassed his people. I don't either. I don't think it's, I, a, I don't think it's true for a second. I don't know. Not, you know, listen, wait, before we say this, because I'll, t- I'll tell you what, RK, people are going to say, oh, you guys are supporting Syria. That's not what I'm saying. Listen, uh, listen, if they're not with Christ, you know, we got an issue with all of them because they don't have the Holy Spirit guiding their, their, their judgment. You know, yeah. I, I believe that we're being sold a bill of goods for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. OK, let me let me say this, that I. Uh, I don't know if Donald Trump was duped into that whole Syrian thing, or if he's, okay. if he's wise to what's going on, it, that's hard for me to say. But I don't, I don't think believe it matters. I don't, it, yeah, it really, it really doesn't matter. Well, it does matter for what I'm about to say, though. Okay. Uh, well, I think I kind of lost my train of thought, so let me talk my way back into my train of thought here. Okay. Um, you know, they said that uh, Assad gassed his people, Trump put people over there, but Trump, oh yeah, yeah, I know what I was going to say now. I knew it would come back. Trump is, for those of you Trump supporters, and I, you know, I, man, it, that's a tough deal for me because I really, I really 
believe in a lot of things that he's talked about out on the campaign trail and all that kind of stuff. Trump, if you go back and look at video footage, just get on YouTube and look for this. Trump was saying that Assad is against ISIS and Russia is against ISIS. And Russia is working with Assad to defeat ISIS. And we're, we're against Russia and Assad. So that means, by default, we are on the side of ISIS. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Hezbollah co co roundly condemns killing Christians. And they're on the side of Assad. Okay? This is the truth. Yeah. Because Hezbollah is on the side of Syria and Iran, and they resoundly, they, they are against killing Christians. They are for, uh, I believe, now I could be mistaken on this, I believe they are for a two-state solution in Jerusalem also as well. Which is not, you know, which of course is what the Antichrist does. Which I think all this is going to come down the pike and everybody's going to join hands and sing Kumbaya. That's where we're right. headed with this. Right? Yeah. But, um, but Hezbollah in their role is, uh, is vehemently against um, Israel and the United States. And they're siding with Assad. And they are against killing Christians. And ISIS... And, uh, you know, I mean, this has come out of President Obama's mouth that we actually are funding them. OK, that we're actually sending money through Mossad and through through uh, our government to the ISIS forces that are killing Christians. And yet we support them. I mean, that t t to me, I'm just like I'm telling all Christians back up for a second and take a look at what's going on. Make sure you know what's going on before you start typing on Facebook and start speaking. You really right. need to understand what's happening here. You're, if you're siding with us and with with uh, with Israel, you're actually siding, you know, with ISIS is with ISIS, really what you're yeah. doing. That is the truth, people. And Donald Trump said, I just saw a video, I think, last night where Donald Trump said that very thing on the campaign trail. Now, yeah. the reason I think that Donald Trump may have been duped is because I think he's, I don't, you know, I don't know about him, man. I mean, he's surrounded with Zionism. And I was even worried about that before I, you know, before I voted for him. But uh, I, I don't know about him, man. Maybe he was duped on that deal. I just don't know about him. I, I'm just, yeah. I'm just really torn. To be perfectly yeah. honest with you, you know. But he said that thing yeah. that that Syria and Russia are fighting ISIS, and we're fighting Russia and Syria. That's right. That means we're fighting alongside of ISIS. Do a study where ISIS is in, where ISIS is at, what cities they are, and they, they weren't out in the middle of the desert where he dropped that Moab bomb. That was just a big ruse to me. I mean, right. and somebody the, out there, <laughs> you know, you yeah, drop it on anyone, and and uh, and people believe it. People believe the narrative, man. And and if this is, you know, this is some stuff to really take a really serious look at. You know, if you're it, just to make sure that you're on the right side of stuff here, because listen, right now the Bible says, "Let no man deceive you by any means," and mm -hmm. that includes Donald Trump and me and RK. So find out yeah. who's right here. Study it out for yourselves. Hey, man, and not only that, but let me throw one more thing in. Let me just go ahead and make some real enemies while we're here, Kevin. <laughs> I'm feeling bold today. I'm feeling bold in Jesus Christ today. Amen. So let me make truth, some, man. Let Tell me make truth. some enemies. The Israeli government is constantly lobbing shells over into Palestinian territory, over on the Gaza Strip and stuff like that. Well, guess what, people? Guess what, my Christian brothers? There are Christians over there Amen. that are getting That's... bombs lobbed at them, and they got them all walled in. You know, the same Jewish politicians that tell us that we shouldn't build a wall, that we're bigots because we want to build a wall between here and Mexico, have got the Palestinians walled in. That's right. And they are lobbing bombs over on, of course, Christians. they're lobbing them over on Muslims, but they're lobbing them over on our brethren. Yeah. They're dying over there. So if you want to call me anti-Semite for saying what I just said, go ahead. But I'd rather be called anti-Semite than anti-Christ. Yeah. And whoever hath not the Father, whoever hath not the Son, hath not the Father also. He is anti-Christ who hath not the Son. Yes, it's, it's, Scripture is very plain. It's very yeah. plain about that. So if I'm making enemies right now, so be it. Okay, so, but... Um, we got to go to Luke twenty one twenty here. Let's get back on track a little bit here. It says, "And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you then know that the desolation thereof is nigh." So, in other words, and I don't know if it's a big setup. I don't. I believe it's probably going to be Iran. It's and you know Syria maybe and or you know something like this of this nature and and um, they're going to 
encompass uh, you know Israel with armies. This is going to be allowed. This is going to ha- it has to happen because the Bible says it will. Okay, then know that the desolation is nigh, and that is a very big indication that the Antichrist is about to be revealed. There's going to be some pretty bad things happen there through this, and some Christians are going to have to flee out of Jerusalem because you remember that the scriptures, whenever it talks about fleeing, whenever whenever Jesus tells us to flee, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to yeah. Christians because we're the only ones that understand it anyway, you right. know, because we have yeah. the Holy Spirit to understand it. So he's right. talking to us to flee out of, out, of, out of Jerusalem. So this is like another big, big sign as well. Okay, and this leads us into what's about to happen after that. This this leads us into to uh, uh, the, the 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 grand. This is where the uh, main character enters in, which is the Antichrist. And we need to go back, uh, RK, to Revelation six, back to the seals again. Six. Uh, it'll be six oh, nine through eleven. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find it. Six now. Okay, I got it right here. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge or avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And uh, uh, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest. Yet a little season Mm -hmm. until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay, so here's a few things here that I want to point out, and R.K. will have some thoughts too, I'm sure, is these are the souls that are under the altar of God. I've heard many people talk about this, that these are all the prophets from back in Daniel's time and Isaiah and, you know, the the disciples and and blah, blah, blah. I've heard all. you got to remember that this is happening during the seven-year tribulation. So these are people that were killed that Jesus was talking about that was killed leading up to the abomination of desolation. These are the people that are under the, uh, that, are, that are talking to God, and God says something very important to note, the language here. He says, a little season. Now, I want you to think about the devil has comes down. He has a short time. We're going to get into that. This kind of language here lets you know that something's about ready to occur. And it says, and God tells them that, that as your brethren – as you were killed, be fulfilled. So this is the war of the saints that's coming because they're wanting Jim to avenge their blood. They're wanting to, to, they're wanting the wrath to start. But God said, not yet, not just as of yet, you know, if your brethren, you know, it needs to be killed as you were for a little season. So they're, they're crying out to God to avenge their blood, you know? And um, so, and then it says for a little season, and then you move on from there. Let's go to Matthew 24, 22. Do you got that up? Matthew 24, 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, these days shall be shortened. And also have Mark thirteen twenty. Is, is that the same thing yes. there? Uh-huh. That's just another and reference it, to it. And except the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen. That's right. <laughs> he hath shortened the days. Yeah, we, we, we're both pre trib so... Or a, a, a predestination, both of us, yeah. we were chosen by God. Yeah. But um, that's another argument, and that's another thing we'll probably... It's another another day. Yeah. yeah, it's another day. True. Oh, and Revelation when he, 6, 9 through 11. Yeah, and when he had opened the fifth seal, um, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to make an interesting comment about that. I think... Sure. I think that that may be Old Testament saints, and I've pulled up Esword. I have this program called Esword that will allow me to pull up scripture that I don't have in the in the program that I've set up. You know, so uh, that's why you saw me grab my magnifying glass and look at the screen because I was uh, looking for a piece of scripture in Revelation 20. Let me see if I can get to it. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Uh, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, Mm -hmm. right? So in the scripture that that I read from you, uh, let's see, where is it again? Uh, They were uh, persecuted for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and these guys were persecuted for the word of God, uh, for the witness of Jesus, 
and for the Word of God. There's a difference there because the Old Testament saints didn't have the testimony of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a testimony. Yeah. They believed the Word of God, which they did. They were saved by believing on Jesus, but they didn't understand even the depth of. They didn't understand how deep it was because they were saved right. by believing the Word of God. Right, right, right. Whatever right. the prophets or Moses or whoever came to them and said, "Thus saith the Lord," they believed it. And Jesus is the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of Revelation 13, they were uh, killed for the testimony which they held and for the Word of God. And in Revelation 20, they were killed for the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God. Right, right, so right. So you right. see why I say you yeah, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's good. It's good. Thank you for the commentary there. Okay. okay I'm, not, I'm not married to it, but I'm just saying it's a thought. You know, it's a thought. It's, it's good. It's got, it's got Bible meat to it, man. Uh Revelation thirteen four through eight. Um, let's let's go into that. Revelation four. What were you saying? Uh, thirteen four through eight. Now, before we talk about this, now now Jesus. Now let's let, mind you. Now uh, he told them that they had to wait for a short space. Remember, the devil has a short time, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but here we will see. Uh, in Revelation thirteen four eight, we're going to see what's happening on the earth at this time. What, what, why they are, why there's a, why he says, you know, there's your brethren be filled as you were killed, like as you were be fulfilled. Okay, so Revelation thirteen four through eight. Go ahead. You ready? Okay. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against a God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwelt in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him." whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Okay, obviously the uh, the world system, because that's what it was is denoted in 1 and 2, the dragon is the world system, it gave power unto the beast. Well, in Revelation 12, the Bible says the dragon is the devil. Right, exactly. That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Yeah, so that's what we're doing. That whole It's the spirituality of Satan, and they follow him. They have one mind, and they follow him. That's in Revelation 17. And they gave power unto the beast, which is this new world system, and they worshiped the beast, saying, and this is interesting, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? They're not saying, oh, my gosh, this system is the greatest system ever. This is the greatest thing we've ever seen. This is great. They're basically like, well, what are we going to do about it? That's the way I read this. Who That's is a like good point. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with them? What are we going to do about this? What are we, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to fight the whole entire world, dude? What are you going to do? You're watching all these Alex Jones channels. All of a sudden, you're going to, you know, there's a lot of people that speak really big. Watch these Alex Jones shows and stuff like that and talk about how the, the, the you know, but what are they doing about it? They're not doing anything about it, and they won't because the scriptures say they won't. And so this is exactly their, their mentality about it. He was like unto the beast who was able to make war with him, okay? So they're, they're, it's not that they're just bowing down and worshiping. It's almost like they're submitting to it. They're submitting to his power. Right. Okay? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And we know who that is. That's the oh, Antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. This happens in the middle of tribulation, people. This is where the Antichrist is revealed. He is not revealed during the first half of tribulation. It is right here in the middle. You're not going to know except for those few little hardcore signs of where we're at in tribulation until he arises, until something is going down and you just it, it's going to come upon you quickly. Okay. And he's given the power to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth and blaspheming against God and blaspheming his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. He is going to call us bigots and racists and everything else, you know, about our, the Bible and about God. Anti-Semites. Anti-Semites is coming. You better believe it. And it oh, yeah, will, that's going to be worse than anything. Oh, yeah. This is what we're getting into here, too. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him to all, over all kindreds and tongues and nations for you people that think that somehow Israel is going to come to God at this, uh, at this moment, it says and power was given unto him to, to over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That includes Israel. 
And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So if you are not with Jesus Christ at this point in time, you will be the one going, what are we going to do about this? What are you going to do about it? Guys, you guys are nuts. You know, all my, these Christians, they're anti-Semites. There's going to be a big divide in the church. This is where the falling away happens. And so we're right here, and we're talking about it. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4 real quick, okay? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now notice that that language that's right there in that thing, it says that they're coming a falling away, and then that man of sin be revealed. Notice that they are up there saying, you know, and I, and I saw one of his heads that were ruined to death, and the deadly wound was, and everybody wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. In other words, they're submitting to the, to the new world system here. Okay, there's a falling away to this. Like, who? what are we going to do about this, right? That yeah. falling away that's happening right there, there's a man that's going to deceive them that's going to say that this is a good thing. They're, he's going to bring Israel. This is important to note. Israel and Islam, the Judaism, Islam, and Catholicism, all of the, the, Abraham, the Abraham religions together under one umbrella, okay? The, everything is, the world is going to unite. There's going to be no more Muslims fighting with Jews. There's going to be no Jews fighting with Muslims and no Catholics fighting with Jews or, or no Catholic. And Catholics, basically, I think the false prophet, comes from the from Rome, but that's my opinion of it. Um, and I think that that you are going to see a unity, a coer unity, of the the of Islam and of Judaism. And there's going to be a lot of Christians that are going to be like going, "Oh, isn't this wonderful? Look at this piece." They're going to be deceived by this. Okay? Yeah. But you, well, you, know, you know, they're already deceived by you know Rick Warren has that Chrislam thing. Yeah. As if, as if Christianity and Islam have anything in common. What they Concord have does zero Christ have in common. Belial. One is, yeah, one is false and one is true. That's right. You, you take a guess which one is false and which one is true. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, there's no such thing as Chrislam. There's Christianity, Bible, Christianity, and Islam. Yeah. And they, <laughs> and they never the twain shall meet. And let, and let me make this clear of what the saints are doing right here at this moment. We are telling people this is not of God. The system that's rising up, this, this, you know, you're, you're joining all these religions together, but it's their, first of all, they're worshiping a false God. We're men of the flesh. We, this peace that you're talking about is not really true peace because you're talking about men of the flesh saying that they're coming together under one God and this peace and unity and kumbaya, kumbaya. It doesn't work. And as we find out, whenever we, you know, whenever we're, you know, no long, whenever God reveals himself and then the, the wrath starts, all of a sudden turmoil starts all over earth. Okay. There, this is a false peace. We know it's a false peace. We know that this is not Christ. This person that's standing up there speaking these great words, we understand that he's speaking blasphemy. Okay. We, under, we hear it because we're Christians and we understand that's not the yeah. way he's speaking is not of God. Okay. And we don't go with it. But here's the problem. There's going to be some Christians, if you read down further in Revelation 13, and I'm going to have to jump off here real quick here, brother, but um, um, I have to work. But, um, but I want to finish this one thought here. If you jump down further, it's, it, it says when he makes war, the, war with the saints, um, and I'll go ahead and read this real quick so I can, I can get into this point. Um, okay. It says that if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And there's going to be saints that war against him. There's, if there, it's yeah. going to, it takes two to war. So there's going to be some saints that ain't going to be buying it. And John warns us to not do this. He says, listen, be, be, go into chill land. You know, Jesus was silent too when he was brought before the king. You know, there's going to be a time where we're going to have to stop putting our necks on the chopping block. Now, I'm sure in our – I don't know I, I don't know if, really if I can shut my mouth. I think I'd be speaking out against it. But, um, but I know that there will be people that will pick up arms and go war, and they say not to do that. And that will be the war of the saints. So there is no peace and safety as of yet. The, the peace and safety, I believe, doesn't come until the mark of the beast, because the mark of the beast will end it all, because we wouldn't be able to buy ammo anymore. It would be the most, it would be the most humane way to end the war. Because if, if we were, let's say it is the RFID chip or something like that. If we were to take the RFID chip, a bunch of things would happen. Number one, they can track us wherever we go. 
They're, we can't buy or sell without the thing. Okay, that's another thing. So how are we going to buy ammo if there's saints warring with them, right? You're not going to be able to buy ammo or anything like that. It would be a way to humanely end the war without killing every Christian on earth at that point in time. That would be the, the remedy to something like that. If you don't take the, it, the, and it would still be a war because if you don't take it, you're going to starve to death. Simple as that. You know, because most of us, I mean, I mean, I hunt at Kroger and, and, and Publix here in Nashville. You know, that's where I hunt at. I don't know how to hunt and fish. I'm not good at any of that stuff. Yeah, amen. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, and my thought, this is my conjecture, man. My thoughts are is that at that point in time, they've got us, and that is checkmate. And that's whenever the sixth seal opens right after that. If you turn the page in Revelation 14, you see the 144,000 and all that stuff. And I know we got a difference of opinion of when the, when the, uh, when the uh, uh, rapture is. But at that point in time, it is checkmate for the Christians. And that's yeah. what I believe happens in the Great Tribulation period. Yeah, I want to say something just real quick before we have to get out of here. I okay. want to comment. I want to make a couple of Bible points. Uh, it's either in John 18 or John 19. I think it's John 18 where, where Jesus said to Pontius Pilate that uh, when Pontius Pilate said, are you a king? And, and Jesus said, you said so. But if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. Jesus is saying his kingdom is not of this world. The devil's kingdom is of this world. The devil is the prince of the power of the air. But Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. And when they came to take Jesus away at the Garden of Gethsemane, and Peter reached out his sword and he whacked off that guy's yeah. ear, and probably what happened was the guy probably ducked, and Jesus was, and his sword went, you know, cut off the guy's ear, you know. But uh, Jesus put his ear back on and, and told Peter, don't you know that whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword? Exactly the same thing that that Revelation verse says. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's a good point, man. That's great. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. You know, a couple of things about that, too. What Jesus did there was so cool because not only did he repair the uh, the, uh, the Roman soldier's ear, but he also um, took away all evidence against Peter oh, wow. of the crime. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Because, yeah, I guess he would have been in trouble over and, it. Yeah. And, and he had plans for Peter. So in, in yeah. spite of Peter's sin and his, you know, <laughs> get thee behind yeah, me. That sins. is good thinking right there, bro. That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's good thinking, man. Yeah. That's wisdom. I call that yeah. wisdom. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. You're the one with the wisdom, man. I'm just, I'm along for the ride, brother. Man, ain't we all, bro? We're along <laughs> for the ride. And thank God we're riding on Jesus's <sighs> coattails, you know? Amen. We're riding in his car. Whatever whatever it is he's got, we're riding in it. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think this has been a good teaching. I think we should stop here, and we can always pick it up later on. There's, I mean, we can, we did a whole hour on this stuff, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, you hey, can. Hey, man, we just got barely got started. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just so much to talk about and so much scripture to cover. And, and, um, and I hope people are blessed by this. I really do. I hope people tune in, and we don't lose them because I know we get really deep. You know, and I, I hope that we don't lose them. I hope they're, they got their Bibles open. And I hope that after we get offline here, I, my, pray, my prayer is, is, is that they say, what are they, you know, let me dig into this a little bit. And, and you know, they, they, even if they're trying to rebut us, you know. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Dig, dig into Scripture, man. That's what we're all about here. We're all about getting in there and digging into Scripture. Now, we're not wanting to argue with anybody. Um, yeah, no, that, that's fruitless. Yeah, it's fruitless. But um, but we are wanting you know people to dig into the scriptures and see what we're saying, and and um, and if it is of the truth, which I believe it is, um, that we're telling the truth about what's about to happen and what's where we're at in the timeline and everything else. I ho I hope that it edifies people and they uh, and uh, and they dig into the word, man. That's the whole goal here. Yeah, amen. And iron and iron sharpens iron. Amen. Does it not? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's probably a good place to that's probably a good place to jump off. Amen. So thank you all. Uh, let's just have, a, I'm going to say a quick word of prayer. Father, okay. Father God, I pray that you do cause people to, to stir up people, even if, even if it's out of anger over something we've said, yeah. cause them yeah. to, cause them to, because I have come to understand Bible doctrine because I was mad about what somebody said and it has turned out to be a blessing. So even if that's the case, Lord, just cause them to go to the Bible because you are the, you are the great teacher. Amen. And bless us and bless us in our comings and going. Kevin's got to go to work. Father, bless him. Help him to be a light in a really dark place. And, well, that's all. Thank you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you, brother. God bless, bless you, you man. God bless you all too, right. buddy.